Hello, and welcome to the transportation edition of City Watch. City Watch is a watchdog program for social, economic, political, and cultural issues here in New York City. My name is Edwina Francis Martin, and co hosting with me today is Jeff Simmons. Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Edwina. Um, so, transportation, transportation. The impetuous creature, a pirate, started forward, sprang away. She had to hold the rail to steady herself, for a pirate it was, reckless, unscrupulous, bearing down ruthlessly, circumventing dangerously, boldly snatching a passenger, or ignoring a passenger, squeezing eel-like and arrogant in between, and then rushing insolently, all sails spread up Whitehall. This line from Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway about a character hopping on the omnibus really aptly describes what is best about public transportation. Speed, independence, technology, the wind in our sails as we go about the city. Um, I also like it because there's a reference to Whitehall. Um, I'm always at the Whitehall station on the R uh, for uh, hopping on the Staten Island Ferry. Uh, MTA New York City Transit is the largest public transportation agency in North America and one of the largest in the world. New York City Transit Subway serves Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, and Queens, and the Staten Island Railway serves Staten Island. It's not easy managing such a behemoth or keeping track of what is going on there. So on our, our transportation show today, we'll check in with the chair of the City Council's Transportation Committee, Adonis Rodriguez, and find out more about what the City Council is focusing on um, transportation-wise, and also learn more about the recent fair fares victory in the city budget. We'll also have Danny Simons from advocacy group Regional Plan Association to talk about their transportation policy issues um, and their focus on transportation um, for the upcoming year. To start today's show, however, we are going uh, to have Gregory Copeland, who is a supervising attorney with the Immigration Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society. Mr. Copeland is representing Pablo um, via Via Vicencio. Via Vicencio, thank you. The 35-year-old Ecuadorian native who was arrested June 1st while making a delivery to the garrison at Fort Hamilton in Brooklyn. Um, Gregory, hello. Welcome to our show today. Hello. Thank you for having me. So, Gregory, this is Jeff. Thanks for joining us this morning. Before we begin discussing the case that has made national headlines, can you tell us just a bit more about your legal background and your work with legal aid? Um, sure. So I've I've been a lawyer with uh, with Legal Aid in the um, Immigration Law Unit for about the past year. Uh, before that, I worked at a law firm in New York City called Debevoise and Plimpton, um, and I'm now the I'm now a supervising attorney o overseeing um, our, our federal court practice as well as uh, as well as part of the New York Family Immigrant Unity Project. So how many people does Legal Aid help each year, and who are some of your clients? What cases do you take on? So um, Legal Aid has several different, several different units and divisions. Um, we've got, you know, a civil, a criminal defense, a juvenile rights pr practices, um, you know, and we, we represent hundreds of thousands of, uh, of, of New Yorkers every year. Um, you know, our, typically we're, uh, our focus is ensuring that um, people are not denied, you know, equal access to justice based off of poverty. So, you know, most of our uh, most of our clients are are people that would struggle to um, pay for their um, legal representation otherwise. So, um, Jeff, this is Edwina again. Um, so, uh, like you, um, I'm an attorney, and I actually made the jump from big firm to not-for-profit. I was at Sherman and Sterling for several years, and then I was at um, Legal Services NYC for many years. So, congratulations to you on making the jump. <laughs> it's not always easy, right? <laughs> There's some things that are difficult about it, but most are most are easy. Um, so, uh, how did you become involved with this case? Um, so this case came to uh, a colleague of mine, Jennifer Williams, who's the who's the deputy chief of the immigration law unit. Um, through, it, through I believe it was a referral, um, and she she got involved with it on, on June seventh. Uh, on June eighth, she submitted a, a stay request to 
to ICE, the Immigration Customs Enforcement Agency that, that you know, detained and is uh, attempting to remove uh, Mr. Villavicencio. And then on, on June 8th, we found out that his, his, his removal was um, likely to happen you know, imminently, possibly over the weekend. So that night, I got involved with the case in terms of uh, pursuing his, his, um, his federal court claims. Can you tell us a little bit about who Mr. Villa Vicencio is? Um, you know, family, how long he's been here. Um, is he the sole breadwinner of the family? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so Pablo came he came to the United States in approximately two thousand and nine. Um, you know, he's he's uh, never left the country since he came. Um, he's he's married to his wife. Sandra, they have um, two children together. The children are three and four years old. Uh, the older child just celebrated her her fourth birthday. Um, he, you know, he is the primary breadwinner for, for the family. Um, he works uh, as is, you know, widely known at this point, delivering uh, delivering food for a restaurant in Queens. Um, and he was detained doing his job. So just walk us through, walk our listeners through exactly what happened when he was detained. What were the circumstances and what's happened since? So he was, um, he was called to the, the Fort Hamilton um, Army base in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. He, he delivered uh, food there on numerous other occasions. He you know, had a relationship and had the phone number of, of, the, of the person that, who, who had ordered the food. Um, when he showed up, it, the the exact circumstances of, of what happened next are, are, are still disputed. Um, you know, the army claimed that he signed a waiver for a background check, but you know, despite requests for this waiver, uh, they haven't been able to produce it. Um, and at, you know, somebody called ICE. ICE came. Um, you know, detained him, handcuffed him, shackled him. Um, this is on June first. They brought him to to be processed and then took him in and have detained him ever since at um, at the Hudson County Correctional Facility in Kearney, New Jersey. So earlier this week, um, Gregory, uh, you filed a formal request demanding that he be released. What is the status of that case? So this, so the, there's a, a number of different, um, you know, challenges that we're making in different entities that were challenging his, his continued detention and the attempts at removing him with. So this is, this is a, requ- a formal request that goes to, to ICE. Um, and, um, you know, it was submitted Monday. There's been no response to it. So, you know, that's not entirely surprising given that, you know, this is the same agency that made the decision to detain him and to continue to detain him despite, you know, the clear um, equities in his case, despite the fact he's clearly not a danger, despite the fact he's clearly not a flight risk. So we haven't heard a re- response to that, but, you know, that's uh, sadly not entirely surprising. You said that this was um, one of a number of challenges. Can you um, share with our listeners what some of the other tactics are you using? Well, um, some of them, yeah. The, so, you know, uh, clearly we're, we're pursuing his, his claim in the you know, United States District Court for the Southern District of New York. Um, you know, that's his, that, that was the, the challenge that, um, that stayed his removal. Otherwise, you know, all of the other efforts uh, would be, you know, fruitless at this point because he, he would likely uh, have already been removed. So, you know, we're, we're continuing to, um, to, to litigate his, his case with, with the district court, uh, we've actually co-counseled with my former law firm, who, um, you know, are um, uh, helping to to pursue his habeas claim uh, pro bono, which is you know very much appreciated. Um, and so, you know, we we intend to you know seek his his release in advance of um, of uh, his his next hearing. Um, and you know how how we go about that exactly is still um, still to be pinned down. So he's applied for citizenship, I think I've read in some of the news reports. Um, what is the status of that, or is it stayed pending all of this? Well, it's, it's, it's not actually citizenship, right? The first step in, in to w- working towards getting citizenship would be for him to get um, you know, legal permanent residency status, or what people typically refer to as a green card. So um, you know, his efforts have, have been to adjust his status through a process that exists for people in his exact situation, you know, who have, um, you know, who have a re- removal order, are married to a U.S. citizen, um, and, and you know, and are seeking to reach out to the government, normalize their status, um, 
know, and work on to to eventually getting citizenship and, you know, making sure that this family could never be torn apart. So I also understand that there is a hearing coming up in July. Can you tell us a little about what will take place then? And will he remain um, incarcerated until that point? So um, that's that's the federal court hearing, and um, you know, initially when we, we we rushed into to court on an emergency basis, we were heard by uh, a judge, Allison Nathan. She set a schedule for briefing and then set a date for July twentieth. Subsequently, the case was assigned to another judge, Judge Paul Crotty, who um, who rescheduled the hearing for for July twenty fourth. So at the July twenty fourth hearing is when. Um, you know the merits of of the of the petition for habeas corpus will will be decided, um, and so you know that's uh, that's what the what we're preparing for for the federal case. In advance of that, he can't be removed. Um, you know the judge stayed his removal such that our our position is, and I think that the the law supports this, is that given that he can't be removed before that hearing, he also shouldn't be detained because he he doesn't present a flight risk or a danger to to the community. So, um, you know, that was, a, that was the, the, the crux of, of the argument we made to, to ICE on Monday. And, you know, we intend to also, given, the, given their non-responsiveness, to, um, to make those arguments uh, to, to the government lawyers as well as to, um, to, the, to the district court. So obviously this week there has been considerable attention on the zero tolerance policy and children being separated from their families. I'm really curious how this case case fits into the climate nationally. Can you speak to that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that you know it it pretty clearly just speaks to sort of the the misguided approach of of you know of approaching um, immigration enforcement without any sort of consideration for you know the particular circumstances that people are in. Um, it also shows that you know family separation is not something that just happens, you know, at the borders. That's happening, you know, in Brooklyn. That's happening in Long Island. That's happening, you know, in, in all of our neighborhoods. Um, you know, and the toll that you're seeing on the the children at the border. You know, the the Pablo's children are suffering too. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that you know it, it, it's um, it's a good example of how um, you know heartless this. Uh, this administration's approach to immigration enforcement um, has been consistently across the board. Oh, and I had also uh, I had also uh, read earlier this week you did have a victory in another case uh, involving a gentleman from Flushing. Uh, if I'm correct, can you tell me a little about that? So that was a case for uh, a gentleman called Ji uh, King Yu, um, and he was you know he was being detained and, and was um, there was fears that he was going to be imminently removed as well. Um, he was he was arrested by ICE on uh, May 23rd when he was attending his his interview for his adjustment of status. Um, and we, you know, legal aid got involved, um, you know, on a emergency basis. Uh, we assisted his his uh, immigration counsel Yi Ling Poon with um, with uh, filing a habeas petition. Um, this is the same team at, uh, from Legal Aid, myself and my colleague Sarah Gilman, and we had a hearing before uh, Judge Annalisa Torres on Wednesday evening, and she um, she granted a stay in his case and orders his immediate removal, or sorry, <laughs> exactly the opposite, his immediate release, um, because you know she agreed with uh, you know she has yet to issue a de- decision, but she I think I think she agreed that there was no reason to keep somebody that's not dangerous and not a flight risk away from their you know family. Um, when there's no reason to. Isn't that the case with Pablo? I mean, there's been no, uh, you know, no information that he is a danger to society. So why, you know, why the difference here? That's that's my question too. So that's the reason that we're we're pushing. We'll be pushing this, uh, you know, to the district court. I, I don't, you know, there's no justification for it. Um, earlier, you had mentioned that his um, Mr. Valencio's uh, daughter turned four recently. I imagine that he wasn't there to help her celebrate, and that must have been so heartbreaking for the family and just so illustrative of the wrongheadedness of of what's going on. Um, to that end, um, are you aware of um, any rallies or events um, planned to to offer support 
to his situation and to his case? Um, I, I think I've, I've heard of some rallies. You know, the, to, to be honest, uh, given that there's been Mr. Yu's case and Mr. Villavicencio's case, these, like, the, the rallies are sort of in other people's, uh, you know, jurisdiction. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, you know, I can't speak directly to them. I, I think that there are some, some rallies planned, though. All right, so um, I know legal aid is divided into the civil, juvenile, and criminal divisions, and you're under the civil, right? That's correct. And um, do you have a hotline, an immigration hotline, um, that you could share with our listeners? We do have a we do have a hotline. Uh, the best way to to access information about legal aid or um, you know his case would be by going to our website, legalaidnyc.org. Uh, or you know, visiting our, our you know, see, following us on Twitter, Legal Aid NYC. Um, I don't have the, the hotline number offhand, but uh, you can access that on, on our website. Okie dokie. We'll try to uh, find that during the show because, as you know, not everyone has access to technology. That's right. So, as I'm just curious, as a result of cases like this, high-profile cases, are you seeing more inquiries come in for assistance? Uh, yes. Yeah, there's been, you know, a, 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 from from um, potential clients as well as, uh, you know, other other lawyers looking for assistance um, with, you know, with cases. I mean, Mr. Yu's case, we reached out to his attorney, and I think that the fact that she knew that we had done uh, Pablo's case probably, you know, was the reason that she accepted our help. Um, and then, you know, we've assisted other people with similar cases across the country. And we got assistance from the ACLU in Massachusetts when we were doing Pablo's case as well. It's also interesting how important social media has played in this because of how many how many times on my feed, for instance, my Twitter feed, I saw the hashtag Free Pablo. And, you know, how important is social media to your effort? Well, I think that, you know, the the, the one of the most significant things about Pablo's case is that, you know, Free Pablo and, and, and the media attention has, has been, you know, critical in terms of um, supporting his family and, you know, having legal aid get involved in the first place. Um, but, you know, it's, what's, what's um, significant to me is that, you know, it, it's really not that unique of a case. This stuff is happening, you know, to so many people across the country constantly. This is just this is just the instant where where it's gotten the attention, you know, that I think it deserves because it's you know it's such a such a traumatizing and and um, inhumane sort of um, thing that's going on. So, so you know, social media has been huge in terms of spreading the spreading the word, um, you know, both both for this case as well as for you know the family separation stuff that's going on at the border now. So, listeners, um, I have pulled up the immigration hotline for the Legal Aid Society. It is 844-955-3425. Uh, so once again, that is 844-955-3425. Uh, I had to make that large font on, on, my, on my iPhone. <laughs> um, but uh, if you know of anyone or if you yourself are experiencing um, immigration-related issues similar to the ones we've been discussing today, um, you can call that line, and um, hopefully someone will be able to help you. Um, are there any other um, issues um, that your unit is focusing on right now, um, either legislatively um, at the city or state level, um, that you'd like to share with our listeners? Um, you know, I think that like most immigration lawyers right now, we're, we're very concerned with um, the separation of of families, and I think that we're we're you know aiming to add whatever skills we can to the efforts to you know reunite families and prevent this these sorts of practices. Um, you know, I think that um, you know I, I oversee a project, the the NIFA project, that is the public defender model for people in immigration detention, and you know I think that now more than ever that's um, you know that's a crucial a crucial um, program funded by the city that uh, that you know I think that um, that people should be aware of. 
All right. Well, thank you so very much for joining our show today. Yeah. Um, I know Adrian Holder, so tell her that uh, Edwina said sends her um, a hello. I will. Thank you for having me. Okie dokie. Have a great Bye. weekend. Thank you. Bye. All right, so we are going to switch our guests around a little bit right now. And so um, Council Member uh, Rodriguez, hopefully, we'll have on later. But next up, we're going to have um, Danny Simons. Um, Danny is the Vice President for Strategic Communications at the Regional Plan Association, um, which works to improve our region's economic health, environmental sustainab sustainability, and quality of life through research, planning, and advocacy. Um, Danny, thanks for joining our show today, and also thank you for being available a little bit sooner than we had planned. Happy to do it. All right, great. Um, so let's start off uh, by just finding out a little bit about you, um, because you have a, an interesting path to the regional um, Plan Association. Um, can you share just a little bit about your journey to RPA and what's in your portfolio at the agency? Sure. So um, I've been working in transportation for about the last 15 years in New York City. Um, I've worked for nonprofit groups and amazing advocates like Transportation Alternatives. I had the opportunity to work under the visionary Transportation Commissioner Jeanette Sadi Khan, where I helped to start the city's summer streets program, um, and I also helped uh, start the weekend walks program, um, and I was involved with a lot of the agency's large-scale um, communications as well as sort of advertising and marketing campaigns for sustainable streets. Um, I left there, and I uh, was able to do some work internationally and in cities across the world on sustainable transportation, really helping share a lot of the things that I've been learning in New York City. Um, and I came back uh, to work on launching the City Bike Program, the, the City's Bike Share Program, which has become, over the last five years, uh, really the most successful bike share program in all of North America and one of the most successful bike share programs in the Western world. Um, and I recently uh, was lucky enough to become a mother and decided that it was time to kind of um, change my schedule and, and have a sort of more reliable, normal work schedule again. And so um, I was thinking about what to do, and I found the Regional Plan Association, which is an amazing organization. They've been around for almost 100 years, and they do uh, planning, research, and advocacy across the tri-state area. Basically, they cover anywhere you can get to on a commuter train from Manhattan, um, and they work on issues including transportation, but also energy and the environment, and housing as well. So it's been an incredible opportunity for me to kind of get to know more uh, about our region as a whole and get to think about some new issues that I that I have been caring about but I hadn't been as connected to in the past. So uh, I feel very, very fortunate to have this opportunity. And I came on to RPA at a time when the organization was launching their fourth regional plan. So about once every generation, RPA uh, produces these long-range plans for the region. Um, and this one has 61 recommendations to help make our region uh, more sustainable, healthier, uh, more prosperous, but especially more equitable because we sort of see our region, uh, it's been so successful and, and there's so much prosperity now, but that prosperity is not evenly shared. Uh, and we're really looking at ways to continue uh, to have our region be very prosperous, but to have that be more shared between more people. Oh, okay. You know, I, um, before I started preparing for our transportation show, I wasn't very familiar with the work of the Regional Plan Association. So it was, it's been fascinating to look at the website and learn about it and also speak with you um, and learn about sort of your plans for the future. Um, I mentioned to you when we were chatting yesterday that I'm an express bus rider. And when I got on my bus to head in to do the show today, there was a pamphlet waiting on on my seat um, and it references fast forward which we're going to um, speak about in a bit but at the back of the pamphlet it says we've used your input to reimagine the express bus network which as I mentioned to you infuriates me <laughs> because I don't feel my input was ever solicited um, and to your know, transportation is maybe one of the few issues that all New Yorkers or many can agree on like never there always seems to be a problem um, it never seems to work the way we want it to or that we need it to, and it can be the source of a lot of frustration. 
Um, having said that, my bus got here in record speed and the subway was great. So, um, you know, but I don't know what to expect from this fast forward plan. Um, so, it, you know, we complain a lot about transportation and our, our public transit. Um, what's, what's MTA and um, New York City Transit getting right? So, I mean, I think that you rightly point out that we are at a point of crisis with both our subways and our buses, um, and you see that in many ways as a rider. You feel that every time you're waiting for the train and it doesn't come, or even when the countdown clock is telling you it's going to be 22 minutes till the next train, and you feel that sense of, everyone feels that sense of rage, like, kind of build up in them. Like, how can this be? Like, we're supposed to have this on-demand, amazing, world-class subway system, and we just don't. Um, but you also see it in the numbers, and really for the for the first time in recent memory, subway and bus ridership are declining. Declined in one year. It's now been two years for that decline. Decline at least for the subways, and a little bit, a little bit longer for the buses. And you you start you start to realize that people are actually making making other decisions and living at a time at a time when time when time was thriving in New York City. So it's it's really unusual um, and not to be expected that that ridership would be declining when the economy is doing well. You see ridership go down sometimes when the economy is in trouble because people aren't commuting to work. They're, they're instead, you know, they're looking for work and they're out of work so they don't have as much need for, for transit. But right now our economy is doing quite well and ridership is still declining. So it tells you that the service isn't really meeting the needs of the riding public and people are making other decisions and they're opting to take um, for higher vehicles like Uber and Lyft. They're opting to ride their own bicycles or to use city bikes. Um, and and make other plans in that way. And that's not a good thing for our city because the reason that our city is um, able to function and be a city of almost 9 million people is because people can get around on transit. Um, and if you have more people in cars and driving, that's, that's a huge problem for our city. So all of that said, we're at this crisis point. The thing that the MTA and New York City are doing right is that they recognize it and they've publicly acknowledged it. And they have this fast-forward plan and a roadmap to fixing it. And before that, the governor came up with his subway action plan, which the MTA started to implement last summer to try to turn things around. So they had some really, like, early action things they started to do. And now this fast-forward plan is a really more comprehensive approach to modernizing and, and upgrading not just the subway, but also the buses, and not just the subways and buses, but also really looking at how to make the entire system more accessible um, to to passengers who have special mobility needs, whether they're in wheelchairs, whether they are have um, whether they're blind or, or um, sight impaired, or even for people like me who now often travel the subway system with a stroller. Um, and so we think that that's really fantastic, and that the leadership that's been shown, um, especially by Andy Byford, who's the new president of New York City Transit, is is really fantastic. You know, I've just, I've seen him in interviews, and he certainly seems very engaged and very willing to engage with the public, and I know I appreciate that. Um, you said a, a couple of interesting things just now, and one of them was that we need to re rethink maybe what we expect from our public transit. Are we being unrealistic um, to, to desire, you know, some sort of on-demand service? Um, and in terms of the alternate services people are using, uh, I stick with public transit, but I, I have to say, I know a lot of people who are turning to um, Uber and the like more and more. Um, but, but moving on to the fast forward, um, just going back to that little flyer that was uh, on my seat this morning on my X10 bus, which whose name is going to change soon. Uh, it starts with fast forward. We're speeding up Staten Island's express bus service on August 19th. Faster, simpler, and more reliable service on newly designed routes, um, which I have to say, you know, sort of makes my heart freeze <laughs> when I hear that. Um, so RPA released a report with a detailed in-depth analysis of the fast forward plan. Um, some of our listeners uh, may not be familiar with what it is. Um, I'm becoming familiar because I have to. Uh, so can you explain what is Fast Forward and then um, talk us through your roadmap to advance the plan? Sure. So um, Fast Forward is New York City Transit's uh, plan to, um, as I said, um, fix and modernize the subways, 
uh, to really look at how to make the bus system um, more efficient, more reliable, to make the buses run on time again, essentially, um, and to make them work for the for the New Yorkers that need them. I think it's really striking um, as part of RPA's research for our fourth plan. We found that there's, you know, this is such a city that everyone thinks of New York as such a subway city, but there's a third of New Yorkers who don't live within a walk of a subway. So the buses are a really essential part of the way that a third of our residents um, need to be getting around the city, and, and they haven't worked for people for a very long time, and, and this plan will put in place ways to do that. And one of the things, as you mentioned, is to really take a look borough by borough at all of the bus routes and to really ask you know, are these the best routes that serve the needs of the communities in the way that they are now? There's been a massive amount of development in New York City over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and in often cases, the bus routes haven't really been rethought in a long time. And where people are living and how they're commuting has changed over that time period. So it makes absolute sense to rethink um, to rethink how these routes are structured. And, and the community uh, input part of that is critical, and it's critical for all MTA and all transportation projects. And I think that the, the MTA and New York City Transit recognize that. I think that they are ramping up their capacity to be doing more of it. It is, I can tell you, having worked in government, um, anytime you do an outreach process, there are always people who get missed and always people who feel like they did not hear about it. In a city of 9 million people where our attention is being grabbed at by all sorts of different advertising and events and things going on in our personal lives and everything, it's really hard to break through sometimes and say, like, hey, come to a meeting and talk about a bus route or come to a meeting and talk about a new plaza or something like that. Um, but I think that the MTA recognizes how critical it is. And like you said, you know, the president, Andy Byford, has been really committed to being more open and transparent and more engaging. And I think you'll see more of that uh, as they go in terms of replanning the, the bus network. Um, the third part of the fast forward plan is really about making the system more accessible to users. Um, I think that they realized that the pace that they were going to make the upgrades to the system so that there's more elevators and more places, so those elevators um, are up and in service uh, more at the time, um, and to provide um, better accessible services to people who can't take the subways or buses at all. Um, it was taking too long to fix those things, um, and this is really a plan to jumpstart that and to and to make those accessibility upgrades much more quickly and to make that really a core consideration um, as the MTA is doing all the rest of their work and New York City New York City Transit is doing the rest of their work. And then on the last piece of the plan, it's really about um, oh, Danny, employee. Um, b- yes. Before you go in the last piece, um, I just need to make a quick announcement um, for our listeners. You're listening to Edwina Francis Martin and Jeff Simmons on City Watch, WBAI, New York 99.5 FM, and streaming live at WBAI.org. Uh, right now, we're speaking with Danny Simons, who's talking with us about transportation planning at the RPA. And Danny, keep going. Right. Um, the last part of the plan, just quickly, is really about employee engagement and empowerment, because I think that um, what uh, President Byford recognizes is that, you know, none of this work can get done without the work of the thousands and thousands of people who are, are part of New York City Transit and part of MTA, because they're the ones who are going to make this happen and make this transformation that really will give everyone uh, a better riding experience uh, in the city. So. And that's their plan. Um, our plan that we just released uh, is called Save Our Subways. It's an action plan for better rapid transit uh, in New York City. If you go to rpa.org, uh, it's on our homepage now. You can read it. Um, and the plan really comes out of our research around uh, the fourth regional plan, uh, looking at ways to continue to improve the subway network. Um, and it really, you know, we were very pleased when Fast Forward came out because it really lines up well with the kinds of recommendations that we wanted to make um, to improve the subway. And we think that the, the recommendations that the MTA is putting forward are really spot on. Um, our plan goes into a little bit more detail about how to get some of those things done. And we have the luxury of being, um, you know, a, a research and, and planning organization. And so, you know, we can kind of think the big thoughts, and it's going to be really up to New York City Transit and the MTA to figure out the nitty-gritty details of how to get it done, but we think that our plan provides a really uh, powerful and useful roadmap. Um, our plan also has a couple things that weren't in Fast Forward that we think are important to consider. Um, today happens to be a fairly cool day in the summer, but, you know, at the beginning of last week, it was reaching, you know, into the 90s already here, and when that happens the subways become unbearably hot. Everyone knows what experience is going down there and just waiting for the Most train, definitely. feeling the sweat kind of drip. 
Um, so our plan actually looks at ways that we can use even some of the technology that, that the MTA is thinking about um, implementing in the subways now, but maybe a few other improvements um, that would really actually help make subway stations cooler, which makes that really healthier for passengers, especially older passengers who can't really withstand the heat as much um, uh, and, and people who work in the subway stations because they have to work in those boiling conditions uh, for long hours uh, during the summer. The plan also looks at ways to make the stations quieter, which is also really important for health and people's hearing, again, especially for MTA workers, but also for all of us who are you know, spending, you know, 10 or 15 minutes in the subway station every day. That has an impact on your hearing if, if you're hearing the screeching and the really, really loud noises uh, that the trains make when they screech into the stations. Um, and also looks at ways to improve the air quality in the stations as well. Um, and then our plan also goes into a vision which, you know, might seem crazy at a time when we're talking about uh, just fixing the subways and getting them back to a state of good repair. But we are, you know, we look out to the to the future and we, you know, we are not, uh, we have the luxury again of thinking about ideas that might take some time to build. But we put forward a vision in our report of where we would recommend new subway lines to be built to meet future needs in the city and, and in some cases to meet the needs that are there today. There are parts of the city where we have incredible population density and density of people who are in low to moderate income households who can't afford a car, who can't afford to just take Uber or Lyft, that would really benefit from subway service. And we should be thinking about where those places are because if we're going to build new subway lines, we have to start budgeting for them and planning for them now if we want them to be there in 10 or 15 or 20 years. When you mention how hot the subways can get in the summertime, the, the uh, stations, um, last night I was at Shakespeare in the park and hopped on the subway to uh, head to lower Manhattan to catch the ferry. And it was actually quite cold outside. It had been raining. Um, the temperature, I think, was fairly low. Everyone was bundled up. But when you got onto that subway platform, uh, everyone was sort of stripping off their layers because it was boiling inside. Um, so um, I wish that we could speak with you longer. Um, there's so many interesting um, things just that you've said today that we could follow up on. So we're definitely going to have to reach out to you when we do our next transportation show. Um, can you say the website for RPA um, just one more time? Sure. If people want to know more about the Regional Plan Association, they can go to rpa.org to find out more, and they can also find us at Regional Plan on Twitter. Um, Danny, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today, and you have a terrific weekend. Thank you so much for having me. This was a great conversation. Thank you. Bye. So our final guest today will be New York City Council Member Adonis Rodriguez. Council Member Rodriguez chairs the City Council's Transportation Committee and has focused on progressive agendas involving transportation, education, economic development, development affordable housing, health care, and environmental protection. As a legislator, he has stood at the forefront of issues important to New Yorkers and led and co-led 37 bills, focusing on protecting and improving the rights of women, immigrants, workers, and all New Yorkers who seek social justice. Council Member Rodriguez represents the 10th Council District covering Washington Heights, Inwood, and Marble Hill. Welcome to the show, Council Member Rodriguez. Thank you for inviting me to the show. It is an honor to be with you guys one more time. WBI has been a friend to our city and community when it comes to move our progress in the agenda, known in the recent year. But when we were organizing the student movement in the 80s and the 90s at City College, we always counted with your voice to help to disseminate, you know, the agenda of the progressive movement in our city. So thank you. Thank you, too, and good morning. This is Jeff. And as you know, we're talking about transportation today. And as the chair of the council's transportation committee, your work has included the passage of 14 bills to ensure pedestrian and cyclist safety. And you've supported the effort to reduce traffic fatalities and expand transportation options into underserved communities. What are some of the issues that the Council's Transportation Committee has been working on? Well, first of all, we've been trying to eradicate an epidemic that is affecting our city when it comes to many New Yorkers losing their life because they've been hit by irresponsible drivers, sometimes criminal drivers who leave the thing after it they hit someone and instead of calling 911 for medical attention, they flee the scene. So we know that making our streets safer for pedestrians and cyclists is important. 
is a, a dealing with the hit and run epidemic that affect our city where last year 44 hit and run happened in our city. Most of them, they were related to damage, vehicle being damaged by 4,000 of those hit and run and they sending individuals to medical, to hospital in critical condition. And one New Yorker is dying average every week after hit by the car who flee the scene. So making the streets safer, it has been something critical for us. Uh, we uh, passed at the council the hit and run alert uh, that similar to the Amber Alert has created a system that when the NYPD has the information of a driver who, who left the scene, then they are, the NYPD is supposed to use the, uh, the hit and run alert to uh, let more New Yorkers what type of car and where those type of car was involved in a crash so that we can try to get those information and put those drivers behind bar. So what are, what are some of the issues you expect the committee is going to address when the council resumes this fall? Well, we will continue. Uh, uh, first of all, working around the MTA. As you know, the council, uh, uh, led by the speaker, Corey Johnson, the committee that I chair transportation, and my colleague, we play a critical role uh, leading this conversation and getting the mayor uh, uh, the, at the end work with us to uh, bring our city also to share the investment to the MTA in this close to $1 billion, that half of the money came from the governors and all the half came from the city. And with that money, the new New York City transit person has the resources that he needs to do the repair and maintenance that is critical in these couple of months. But at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is to make the MTA more responsible when it comes to be more transparent on how they are building any project, uh, to get the MTA also uh, more accountable when it comes to do project on time, and for the MTA to focus in the next couple of years more in maintenance and repair, but at the same time to provide the new leadership of the MTA with the resources that they need in order to take the transportation system to the 21st century, making the transportation safer and more efficient. And and you bring up uh, the MTA, and uh, recently Andy Byford had proposed the uh, $19 billion investment plan for the subway system, which calls for spending not on uh, not just only on new subway lines, but on investments to improve capacity and accessibility. What are your thoughts on Andy Byford's proposed plan to fix the subways? I think that he come with a with a lot of experience, and he come with a vision, and he uh, in meetings that we already have with him, he's uh, clear that he wants to be measured by uh, bringing our transportation system to the 21st century. This this is something that a New Yorker has been asking for decades. The crisis that we face today at the MTA did not happen overnight. This is a crisis, and when it comes to mass transportation. That is a result of many decades where we had not invest, invested the necessary resources on the MTA. And also there have been a, a lack of transparency when it comes to how the MTA also invests those billions of dollars. Everyone should know that the MTA is a $1 trillion value of corporation. So it's not only lack of resources, it's also about, it's also about lack of leadership. So in that other end, they also... And they come with those experience, and I, it, I hope that he will be a, a leader that will leave the legacy to make the mass transportation system more efficient and safer for everyone. And you said this is a crisis that did not happen overnight. Uh, how would you characterize Governor Cuomo's actions involving the uh, New York City transportation issues? Well, I want to be open minded and I know that the governor uh, has this opportunity to uh, uh, rebuild the MTA, and as, as the Mario Como Bridge has been built in a few years uh, with enough resources, with, with the resources that were allocated from the beginning, and a project that was uh, finished on time, as La Guardia is going through reconstruction, as, as a city also, we've been going, going through a lot of projects, and the mayor uh, developing the uh, UPK computer for all many projects. I believe that the governor, Governor Cuomo, and Mayor de Blasio, and together with Speaker Johnson and the council, we need to bring the city and the state together 
and be more accountable. And it is our responsibility to be sure that our buses, our trains, our ferry, they are running on time. And, you know, we have, we cannot fail to the 8.5 million New Yorkers, to all the residents in the Northeast, and to the nation. The MTA is important only for the city. It's important for everyone. But it's also very important for the underserved community who live in transportation deserts to also see more buses, more trains in the neighborhood. So I believe that with the chairman of the MTA, Lauder, with the new New York City Transit, and with the support that we will provide from the state and the city, we can, that we can be able to, to rebuild this system, not in 40 years, but in the next 10 years, are the system that should not be behind any other major city that they have more modern public system of transportation. So that's my hope, and I believe that the new, the new New York City Transit has the experience and has the commitment to work with us to make that important change. So what do you think of the proposed Brooklyn-Queens connector? I believe that we need to be open to any new idea. I hope that we, uh, as we've been working and, and we saw it so as an extension of the seven train, that there was a new initiative, a new way of how money was raised, capturing the value it, it, with the new developments happening there. I hope that they, within that new train that will be benefiting not only the residents of Brooklyn, but also many individuals that they move from Manhattan to that area. I hope that we, we should be open mind. And I know that we know that there has been, the study has been done. That there are more discussions that have to take place. The question is, is it the right investment? Is it something that, that we should, you know, do it for the residents of that neighborhood, but also for, and also for all the whole city? Can that model be used uh, in all the places of the city? So there's a lot of expectation. And as a chairman of the Transportation Committee, I'm open to continue discussing a way of how we move uh, the, that project. And another issue that has been in the news has been concerns about the uh, L train shutdown. Give us your views on that. Well, we have a hearing this week, a, a, a hearing that a, a, led by Speaker Johnson and the Committee of Transportation that I chair, we will be holding a hearing to hear from the MTA and DOT more information on how the rebuild of the L train uh, will take place in that area. We know that reconstruction must happen because that area was damaged when after Sandy. Uh, the question is, how can we do the L train uh, reconstruction and the shutdown of the L train should happen in a way that uh, we need to bring buses uh, a more protected bike lane and all the alternative transportation so that the 100,000 or individuals that use that area, that lane, every day, they should have all the alternative on how to move around. Uh, by understanding that it will not, during the period of time of the reconstruction, we know that there's going to be disruption going on in that area, but we need to minimize it as much as possible. And that's why we were here from the MTA and DOT next week, as we will be holding a hearing. Uh, with the Speaker Johnson and myself and all my colleagues. And for our listeners, that uh, hearing is going to be held on Wednesday at 1 o'clock at the Jacob Burns Moot Courtroom at Benjamin Cardozo School uh, in uh, Brooklyn Center at 55 Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, um, uh, in New York. And so just going back a little to uh, talking about your priorities on the budget, obviously there was a victory recently, the Fair Fares victory. Can you tell us your views on that and how that's going to impact New Yorkers? Well, first of all, okay, community service societies with Mr. Jones and, and the Riders Alliance and, and many advocates group, faith aid leaders, we came together, and for many years we were fighting, trying, trying to make New York City the largest municipality with a fair fare that benefits those New Yorkers that live on the poverty in, on the poverty lines in our city. So, with a fair fare, those New Yorkers who are 800,000 uh, will qualify to benefit with a major reduction of the metro car 
and this is something that this is a program that will be starting in January. It took us a, a, a long period of time. In the last budget, I led the initiative together with the advocate group with, the, with a great coalition and my colleagues. Unfortunately, they, they didn't make it to the budget. But this time around, the speaker took his leadership. We worked together, and we were able to establish the fair fair program again that it will start in January next year. So we've got a few a uh, few minutes left, and one thing I had noticed uh, on your Twitter feed uh, was that. Uh, you know, reflecting also on our first conversation that we had on the show uh, this morning with Gregory Cro- Copeland about the Pablo Via Vicencio case, uh, you weighed in regarding uh, what's going on with the uh, zero tolerance policy, and you called on centers to stop covering the faces of migrant children who were detained here in New York City, uh, which in your press release you had called that you they were dehumanizing children. Can you elaborate on that? First of all, I, I believe that Everyone has to understand that as we talk about the MTA, that the crisis, the crisis did not happen overnight. This immigration crisis did not happen overnight. This immigration crisis that I've been going through is not only the responsibility of the Republican, but we, it is also the Democrats, our brothers and sisters in the Democratic Party. We also failed in the past for not passing immigration reform when we had control of the Congress. Also, some of the law that, unfortunately, this president is using were also law that were made in the previous administration. Uh, this time around, President Trump has shown his color. It's clear that he doesn't care for our nation because when you go after children, when you go after working class New Yorkers, that they cross in the Rio Grande or they, or they come with a visa, and they stay here or they come from any other countries they should know that this is the history of our nation. So what I believe is that the separation of those children should not happen. I believe that the solution of that crisis is doing immigration reform now. At the same time, it is good that we saw an executive order made by the president that is supposed to be stopping the separation. But we cannot wait for that program to be reduced or stopped. We need to address those thousands of children that they are being separated. Some of them being, they being, have been brought from Texas to New York City. And I believe that uh, we need to protect the, confi- the confidentiality of those children. But at the same time, when someone get their face covered by carbon mask, uh, probably we don't get to see the impact at the moment. It is later in the light that those individuals start are questioning. What happened? Why, why they were not able to walk in the street uh, as, as another children? We are not talking adults. We're talking about children from four to 12 years old. So I hope again that those institutions that they are a, a serving as center, they should come out with a better plan, uh, protecting the confidentiality, but at the same time trying to maintain those children uh, in a better way or how they are walking in the street. The, I, I believe that the way covering the face for me uh, is a red flag. It's something that we should address. Uh, I think that, and again, it's a balance of com- protecting the confidentiality by the same time that they are not dehumanized. So thank you, Council Member, for that. We've got... Uh only uh, maybe about 30 seconds or so left. Can you just tell us a little about how people can find out more about your work? And uh, also, to follow, uh, what I noticed, you have a very vibrant uh, Twitter feed at, at Y-D-A-N-I-S, so I encourage people to follow that as well. But give us a sense of just how people can uh, find out more about what you're up to. They can go to our, uh, connect with our Twitter. Uh, they also can call our office uh, uh, 917-521-2616 or go to the council and clicking on my name, they will get the information. And I believe that we need to expand the work that many progressive council members have been doing in our city with an effort to build a city where New Yorkers who are working class live in dignity at the same time to advocate for more children of the working class to be part of the middle class. 
Council Member Rodriguez, thank you so much for joining uh, us on City Watch today. Uh, just for our listeners, I'm going to say the uh, website for the council. It's council.nyc.gov, and you can um, look up uh, information on all of the council members on that page. Um, council thank Member, you. have a great weekend. Thank you, guys. Thank you, too. Well, listeners, I can't believe it. Another edition of City Watch has come to a close. Um, thanks, Jeff, for co-hosting with me today. It, it was, was a great. pleasure. Yes. I look forward to more. Uh, as do I. Um, thanks also to our engineer, Sean Rhodes, for another flawless performance on the boards. And thanks especially to you for listening and supporting the show. We're simply unable to do any of this without your generosity. Remember, if you missed any part of the show or just want to listen in again, the MP3 download is available at www.wbai.org. Click on Archives and then City Watch. The show will be up and ready online in about 10 minutes and will stay up for 90 days. That's it for us. Stay tuned for On the Count and enjoy your weekends.